I'll invite you to open up your Bible if you brought your uh, Bible with you or if you brought your electronic text. It'll also be on the screen here. Well, it is on the screen here. Here we go. <clears throat> we are starting this new series together, looking at the book of uh, Philippians, looking at what we're calling it the first church, not like, like the first church down the block or the first or second or third Christian Reformed church of whatever. We're calling it first church because, well, we want to pay attention to what the first church kind of did. This is Paul's first church, and these are his first few words to his church. Paul and Timothy, servants or slaves of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Who do you think you are? I'm not talking about uh, the confrontational question that you may ask of the person who just slid in front of you in line at Starbucks. I mean, where do you go to search and find meaning for yourself? Maybe do you search for it? What have you found? What do you call yourself? What do other people call you? If you caught a glimpse of that last slide, you may remember that uh, 1980s classic movie, The Breakfast Club. And you may remember the prison guard, <clears throat> I mean, assistant principal, Mr. Vernon, who asks, who are you, right? Who do you think you are? Well, have you asked yourself lately, who am I? What about your kids? Who are they? Who are they becoming? What about your roommate? Who are they? What are they doing? Our community around us will inform us a lot about who we are, and that's why Paul is invoking his sense and right to this church community. Comedian Jim Gaffigan will tell you that it's the second thing that people say about you that they actually think about you. It's not the first thing, it's the second thing. You know, it's like, um, hey, you know Dave in accounting? Dave, no, I, don't, I can't think of Dave, Dave. You know, Dave in accounting on the third floor. Dave in accounting. You know, the red-headed guy with a beard and a limp. Oh, Dave, yeah, Dave in accounting. You see, it's the second thing that people remember about you. I'm not sure about this text this morning and reading it what grabbed onto you. But have you ever called yourself a slave? Has anyone ever called you a saint? How is it that we are to be called holy as the early church seems to be called old, over and over again? And how can we ever live up to it? Seems like when it comes to identifying the church, it, it needs to start with recognizing who it is. Paul starts this for them. This is the first church of Philippi. Might as well be called that. It is Paul's first church. That's why we've called it this in the series. We're watching as this new pastor, looking at this new church in Philippi, and we're kind of borrowing some of their notes as we at Hope Fellowship Church have entered a time of strategic planning ourselves. Paul starts with identity because he wants to make sure that they get that right. He's writing to them about the mid-60s. This is not too, too long after Christ has, has died and has risen. And the church is newly formed and started. But like any church, like any community, they're in need of defining who they are, discovering who they are. And now that they know that they were a church, eh, they needed to figure out what to do as a result. Seems like a, they had a community of faith, but of what kind? You see, these are questions of identity. Questions of belief. For out of them, everything will pour. If you believe that you are a saint, then you will act like a saint and surround yourself with saintly things and expect the saintly around you. If you consider yourself a slave, then perhaps 
the future for you is much more bleak. In something like The Breakfast Club, everyone was defined by a certain title. I think they still have those titles today. The titles have just changed. Well, let's read that text maybe one more time, and that will help us. Paul and Timothy, servants or slaves of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people, holy people, in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. It says, to all God's holy people. Another translation says, to all the saints of Christ Jesus in Philippi. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, I get it confused. I thought Paul was the saint here. Maybe going through a little bit of an identity crisis, I guess. I knew one child care professional who said that the role of the parent is not much more than allowing your child to discover who they are without hurting themselves or anyone else in the process. There's more to it than that. Paul is not the father to this church, though, but he's reminding them to clean their room and to not have all these disputes, as we'll see in the further chapters, because it's only hurting themselves, and it's getting in the way of them knowing who they are, and they're just not living like it. In the 1970s, a guy named Eric Erickson asked this question. And he gave us a lot of the language we have for things like identity crisis or midlife crisis. He says that everyone develops their sense of identity through a sense of community. Everyone has a need for identity. The answer to that question, who am I? Erickson says it this way. In the social jungle of human existence, there's no feeling of being alive without a sense of identity. And it seems like God agrees. He answers this for us, even preemptively. We can read it in the Psalms. Psalm chapter 22 says, from birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Or more familiar, Psalm 139. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Or Paul's own words to the Ephesian church. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. The idea of coming of age is nothing new. Paul recognized it well before Eric Erickson did and the folks of Disney have done the same. See, Breakfast Club may fit for the 1980s, but uh, there's, a, there's a new version of the coming of age classic. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you have seen, this is the, um, an ad for Inside Out 2, but there's a first one. Um, oh, Inside Out is the story of Riley, uh, a girl who's discovering who she is by bouncing off the world around her, trying and learning different things and different experiences. It is, um, for lack of a better term, a, a coming-of-age movie. It's just like The Breakfast Club in this way, except for it's all just kind of focused on one animated person and the ongoings in her brain. If you watch the first one, it's the story of her becoming acquainted with um, raw emotions like joy or fear. This time around, she gets acquainted with things like embarrassment or ennui. She must be formed again, she discovers, as she's going through her teen years. And if you listen to Erickson, apparently there's another re-examination that happens about the midlife crisis that ends in either you know, a sports car or something like this in the driveway or, or something else. Identity will change what we do. The identity is who we are becoming what we do. So how do we, how do we live as saints? How do we live up to the Holy One's title that has been given to us? Well, in the tradition of the Catholic Church, you must perform two miracles. How are you doing? 
You see, even in the Catholic Church, saintliness is tied to something you do. And so Paul is trying to shape this church, not just by what it thinks, but by what it does. And so as we take a look at where Philippi actually is and where it's located, Philip of Macedon, the father of Alexander the Great, he built the town of uh, Carenides and named it after himself. It had flourished because of the gold mines nearby, but those days were gone now. Now it flourished as a Roman colony, having been favored both by Mark Antony and uh, Octavius following their victory over the armies of Brutus and Cassius, uh, the assassins of Julius Caesar, if you remember. Uh, it's about 100 years before our uh, Philippian church. Anthony settled his soldiers there, and uh, Octavius, now uh, Caesar Augustus, uh, located his Italian families there. So soon after 30 BC, Philip Philippi became this Roman colony. It was an administrative capital city of sorts. And the proud inhabitants were Roman citizens whose official language was Latin and not the Greek or Aramaic they would have been used to. Uh, Luke, in his gospel, provides an account, uh, actually it's in Acts, uh, provides the only account or beginning of this Christian mission. It's in Acts chapter 16, if you want to hear how this church got started. It was in response to a vision and a call to come over to Macedonia to help us. Please come to Macedonia and help us out. And Paul and his companions made a slow start to a riverside place of prayer where Lydia and some of, other, some of the, uh, her, her friends there responded. But difficulties continued in the area. They were, uh, Paul and Timothy were victimized. And uh, the local church also victimized by local anti-Semitism and charged with civil disobedience. You see, Paul still carried some of his being a Hebrew with him. Paul and Silas endured beatings, and uh, this is likely one of the first times that Paul is in prison. It's the first time he's come up against Roman power. He even mentions it to his, uh, his friends in Thessaloniki. He's, he says to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 2 that he had been uh, shamefully treated and suffered while he was in Philippi. But yet, Paul makes two other visits there. As uh, one commentator said, the, the letter to Philippi that Paul wrote had, uh, had the dust from the ground because Paul had been there. But yet, this church had been involved in the same conflict for years, generations, really. And if you read verse 30, uh, a little bit further on in our chapter here, he says that, the same conflict which now has embroiled me is embroiling you, and it's now the same everywhere. He's relating to them, identifying with them. He's reminding them that identity can't be found merely in who gave you your name, Philippi of Macedonia, or what products you produce, like gold or laws. Paul reminded them that their identity was rooted and shaped by what they contain. You see, Paul is reminding them that their identity was not found in Philip of Macedon, nor in these new Latin speakers. And he's asking them, inviting them to consider the question, who are you being shaped by? And he says over and over, including our text, in Christ. Because Paul knows that as he is decreasing, Christ needs to increase. Leads us to the question of holiness. Man, that's a difficult word, saintliness, for us to grab onto. Maybe if you're being introspective here, looking inside, the first question you have to ask yourself is, am I really a, a good person? Am I holy? Am I the saint that Paul is calling me? Saints? Saints? Us? I don't think so. St. Paul, sure. You see, life is a, a little bit like, well, we find ourselves kind of throttling through this world. All of us are made out of different, uh, different stuff. Got these little foam balls here. Um, if I were to fling this really hard against a rock, it would probably make a mark, right? Is that, is that fair to say? Well, here, I'll help you out. I brought a slingshot. 
So like, you can imagine if I did something like that, just catch, thank you, oh, sorry, I think you got it, Emmanuel, thanks, okay, good, everyone's good, all right, one's over there. So are there any marks on that one, Emmanuel? You wanna take a look at that one? Here, I'll put one over there somewhere. You got it, Jim, all right, thanks. Any, any marks on it? Oh, little tiny ones? I'll do what I can, guys, but I can't promise. Well, that one, might, that one went all the way to Evelyn back there. Got to get those. I'll, I'll, I see you guys. I see those hands. All right, you ready, boys? I did what I could. Did I overshoot? Oh, man, it went all the way to the back. Okay. As we are throttling through this world of life, as we discover ourselves, we discover we're made of different stuff. Some of us might be foam balls. Some of us are made of a little bit harder material. Even that harder stuff when it comes flat up against a rock though is still gonna leave a mark. I brought something else. If you're young, you may not know what this is. It's silly putty, that's right. So silly putty has lots of qualities, like it's, it, it'll bounce. I, I have an extra one up here, so I can probably show you. So it'll bounce. Um, do, you, do you know that, like, we used to do this all the time. We used to take it and push it on, like, newsprint. And if you could read, like, mirrored backwards, you could, you know, read the text that was on there. The story of silly putty was actually, it was, I think it was discovered by accident by the U.S. Army when they were working with rubber compounds during the Second World War. Uh, that's a... Cliff Clavin moment for you there. Um, silly putty has this unbelievable quality. And I'm going to borrow this you know, $1,000 word. It has the quality of, SM, well, um, of, of being able to be manipulated or shaped by whatever it comes in contact with. And the word I want to teach you is the word SM plastic. And silly putty doesn't have that. SM plastic means the ability for you to retain your shape Okay, and that something as it hits you will be impacted in such a way that it becomes formed to you. So let me give you an example. I take the silly putty, I put it here, I put it on my text, I can read that text. It becomes formed by what it's run into, okay? Silly putty, if I put it in the slingshot and I you know, slammed it against the brick wall, it would, after I removed it, probably have a pretty good um, whatever, replication of what's on the wall. You see, in this life, we are all finding ourselves slung. And as we find ourselves in this state of SM plasticity, a quality of being able to be shaped, we find ourselves encountering at least two things, and maybe you can think of more as you, um, as you go through your day. There are two things that I thought of that will always shape us when we run headlong into them. One is this world. No matter what happens, the Bible reminds us that sin is one of those things that has entered into this world, and sin has changed us. The Bible says that all have sinned, and in the same way that we run into this world, that changes us and leaves a mark, a mark that we cannot change ourselves. Which leads us to Paul's encouragement to them to find their identity in Christ. Their salvation can only come, come by Christ. That's what our text says this morning. And by Christ, we can have a different run. And you see, that's the other person or thing that I've discovered in this world. The world will change you if you run headlong into it. But an encounter with Jesus Christ will change you in such a way that you can't help but walk away with his marks on you. You can't help. I know this because of Paul. And Paul's life was so changed, it changed everything that he did. Everything that he was, was a Saul who served the Lord Yahweh and the law and instead, by service, he finds himself changed to Paul, changed to a man filled with grace and understanding grace relatively differently. You see, he understood that 
as he decreased, Christ could also increase. And when we get to actually chapter 2, we'll discover some amazing things happen when people allow themselves to be changed. Evelyn, I want to go to uh, two slides from now. A church is a community of those who believe that their identity is formed by Christ in wherever they are. For this church, it was Philippi. For us, it's Curtis. And this church has had a history over the last 25 years. I've, I've learned that even we've seen many people go on to be leaders in other churches. And the church at Philippi is a shining example of exactly that, that the church is all of those who believe that their identity is rooted in Christ. And I know this from verse 1 of our text. What does Paul say? That you are saints because of what? Because you are saved by Christ in Philippi. Let's them know that you are the saints there. It's Karl Barth who says it this way. The designation of the Philippians as the holy ones or the saints of Christ describes the condition in which they find themselves. On the specific mind and attitude towards them on God's part and not vice versa. Holy people are unholy people who nevertheless as such have been singled out, claimed and requisitioned by God for his control, for his use, for himself who is holy. Their holiness is and remains in Christ. Identifying as a saint does not mean that you will actually walk the perfect life. In fact, Paul recounts in Romans 7 the difficulty of being able to do the things not wanting to do and the struggle. Despite our desire and our attempts to not want to fall subject to sin, Christ is still the answer. Identifying as a saint requires us to empty out all of us for the filling up of the holiness of Christ. Any of us that remains is too much. And it's not merely for our information, but it's for our formation. It's for the formation of the community of active followers of Jesus who bring other people into real and meaningful relationships with God and with others. Not just to know, but to do. And so how do we do this? Well, by Christ as our example. We have this one word, and we'll pick this up again um, in the weeks to come. This word is kenosis. It's the idea of emptying oneself in order to be filled up again. It's the willingness of emptying an hour or two on your calendar to fill it up for an hour or two of somebody else, for somebody else. It is um, exactly the word that is used by Paul when it says, who Christ, who emptied himself, kenosis, of all but love, and humbled himself to death, even death on a cross. This is the same kenotic encouragement that we are encouraged by Paul to experience. Because identity is more than an idea, it becomes what we do in practice within a community. Now those two things are gonna be unpacked over the next two weeks. But this is the action of those who are willing to accept their identity in Christ, willing to accept the shape that he's conforming us to, is kenosis. Willingness to displace oneself, may even made to feel uncomfortable considering what it may look like to live as saints or even slaves in this world. As the title of this message went before us, we have to get our ID ready. We've got to get our ID ready. But it's okay, it's a process. There's an old song, he's still working on me. 
to make me what he wants to be. Took him just a week to make the moon and the stars. Yeah. He's still working on us, and that's okay. But we believe now, just like we believed 25 years ago, that he will continue to work on us as we empty ourselves and continue to be filled. So there's a few ways that we can do that. First, you have to ask, are you willing to play a part? I'm reminded of the blind man at the, at the gate who was wanting to be healed, and Jesus said, well, are you willing? Never, never got an answer. Not from Luke's gospel. Hmm. Are you willing? Are you willing to play a part? I think it's only fair that, um, that if we ask you to do this, we have to give you some outlets for practice. And so first, today before you leave, you'll have a chance to be anointed. We have people who will be at two stations at the front and two stations at the back. Just come forward. They will anoint your, either your hand or your forehead as you're comfortable. It's a, it's a sign, a mark, invisible for many, oh, unless they get close. It's like our identity, you see. It requires proximity for others to take notice. Anointing is a mark for those who know that they are part of the work of emptying themselves that is ongoing. And the practice of becoming more like Christ is a journey that he's still working on us. Being anointed is a way that the church has marked people on this journey, has prepared them. Another way that you can start to form your identity is to make a commitment to join us for one night, maybe more, of this week of prayer and fasting. Every night, Sunday to Thursday this next week, 7 to 8 o'clock, we're having it right here. We will be praying for you. And we invite you to come and pray with us and for each other. We'll be praying for the people not here. We'll be praying for you at home. Because we recognize that there is work to do. If you want to take your identity for a walk, next week is Rev Up Sunday. And you will have a chance after the service to join us for basically, it's like a ministry fair of sorts. Get to see all the different things that are happening. Get to find out how we are already active in our community and how you can join into places like the food bank or the gate. Maybe you feel like you don't have any strengths, nothing to contribute. Well, that's fooey. Our God is a God who makes the weak strong, and he uses the useless to do amazing things. If you missed that this summer, go back and listen to a couple sermons. Here, we use a tool called strength finders to help us discern how we are connected to each other. Paul Paul calls us a body. We're all very different, eyes and ears and mouths and nose and all that, but yet we're all connected. If you want to know more about that, that's part of our Welcome to Hope class, which is one of the first ways of getting involved in membership here. That's happening in October, November, um, 9 until noon on a Saturday. Stop in the Welcome Desk or uh, check out the app to get started with that. It starts with asking ourselves, are we ready to be emptied to be filled? So, slaves or saints? Which are we? Which are you? The word is servant in our text as we read it. Paul calls himself a servant, I think, because he knows that there's work to do. He is, he's writing to Philippi, and he loves these, these people. But it's, it's not just a friendly letter. He's not visiting with friends to catch up. When Paul began his preaching after his life and identity were completely overhauled, he began his preaching with a letter like this, where he started with the words, grace and peace. To this church, his first church. We say it here almost every week, either during the greeting that happens at the beginning or the parting blessing at the end, that maybe to some of you that's become routine. Grace to you and peace. I can never imagine it becoming routine for Paul. You see, Paul's earlier zealous defense of his Jewish 
tradition and his violent persecution of the group that in the same name, in the name of Jesus, in the name of grace, upon all without distinction, Jew or Gentile, I don't think it ever faded from his memory, that encounter. That day when grace and peace collided. It was his past that made his blessing of grace and peace a miracle every time he said it. For that matter, every time anyone says it. You see, Paul's letter to Philippi is, well, it's a lot more than the final letter that Brian has to write at the end of Breakfast Club. See, Breakfast Club was a group of people who were on detention, you see, having to spend their Saturday together because of something that they had done. And in the midst of that coming together, they discover a little bit about themselves, how they're all on their own separate and distinct walks of life, but yet how they share so many things in common. It's um, Brian's letter at the end that says it this way. Dear Mr. Vernon, we accept the fact that we had to sacrifice a whole Saturday in detention for whatever it was that we did wrong. But we think you're crazy for making us write an essay telling you who we think we are. You see us as you want to see us, in the simplest terms, in the most convenient definitions. But what we found out is that each of us is a brain and an athlete and a basket case, a princess and a criminal. Does that answer your question? Sincerely yours, The Breakfast Club. I think he's borrowing a little bit from Paul when he tells us, you are a body. You are all connected, different parts, but through Christ, through Christ, you are one. Let's pray for that unity today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence with us already, and we ask now as we turn to this uh, time of anointing, this opportunity for us to respond, we ask that you speak to us. Just these two simple words, grace and peace, Lord. May they dwell with us and linger like the uh, oil that we have. Cover us, Lord, we pray. And that as you are the anointed one, you are the Christ, the Messiah, that we are your followers, may we also go from this place anointed not only for uh, being marked out, but also anointed to do good works. Allow us to join in for what you'd have us to do, Lord. Mold us and shape us, Lord, we pray. And help us with those things that put marks or, or chinks on, the, on our life as we slingshot through. Be with us, Lord. Keep us safe, we pray. And speak. In Christ's name, amen.